if you want light artillery. Um, everything that we have here is authentic and is exactly uh, as near as possibly can be reprodu reproduced, even as far as the stitching and the shirt, uh, the shoes, brogans are all are authentic. Uh, the Civil War soldier from Vermont usually wore long underwear, but we don't have it on today. Uh, that's where we draw the line. We don't that Some soldiers do, but not me. Uh, I joined uh, the Hemlocks about five years ago. And I didn't really know what I was getting into, but I, I uh, read Full Duty, which is, uh, I think you people have, have looked at or seen the book Full Duty by Howard Coffin. And it talks about the Vermont Civil War soldier. And uh, I wasn't sure if I had any ancestors that were, were veterans of the Civil War or not. But uh, unfortunately, I think my relatives came over in 1861 from Ireland. So uh, it's pretty iffy that they would get to do the in fighting. There were a lot of Irish soldiers that came over at that time. And there could have been an ancestor of mine there. Uh, and I wish that I could find it. I'd be real proud of that. Because, well, uh, but the Vermont soldier uh, was primarily in his own little world up here on the hills, and he was working probably for his father and his grandfather were on the farm. And he didn't have a wife, and there probably were very few girls around. And uh, so when the Fort Sumter was shot on, fired on. Uh, he thought it might be a way to get out of Vermont and see the world. There had been a lot of uh, abolitionists around and uh, a lot of temperance leagues, people having big meetings. And they were uh, against slavery and all of that uh, cruelty there. Um, the soldiers kind of bought into that probably, but I don't think that was the big reason. The reason they wanted out was to get out from behind the horse. They didn't want to shovel manure anymore. They didn't want to wade in the snow. and They wanted to see the world just like any other young person that, uh, today. And also uh, patriotism was real, real big then because uh, the Revolutionary War was just over with short while ago and they heard their grandfathers talk about that. And so when the call came, they were ready to go. And, and as Vermonters, they signed up by the drove. And the first uh, soldiers went in. They thought it was going to be over real quickly, first off. They, they thought they'd go down and they'd whip the rebels and it'd be all over. Well, it didn't work that way. And uh, they paid dearly for it. Um, the first soldiers were in for three months. They thought 90 days they'd be in and out. That was the first Vermont Brigade. And they went to Bull Run. And when they got to Bull Run, you probably have heard about that. They, they got tramps. And there were people from Washington came out in carriages and sat on the hills, ladies with their big bonnets and picnic baskets. And they thought it was going to be like watching a football game or something like that. Well, it didn't turn out that way. They got there was a lot of bloodshed, a lot of loss, and, and then the, the Union troops panicked and ran for home. And they got as far as Washington. Some of them uh, would take a week to get back. So uh, it wasn't off to a good start. And then Lincoln, President Lincoln, called up for more troops, and uh, and Vermont was set to do their full duty, and that's where this title of the book comes from, which you will read. And uh, they did. They signed up uh, in droves to go to battle. And uh, now it was a, a real patriotism thing. They, they, uh, and uh, they went down to Virginia. First off, they would gather in places like Montpelier and St. Johnsbury, <coughs> and they give given some drill. Not a whole lot. They might be there for in general, they might be there two weeks, they might be there a month. They learn camp life. They raised the devil. They got into trouble. They did all kinds of things like any normal young people would do. And uh, and then they went off to Brattleboro, which was the jumping off point. And uh, 
They generally would ride a train down to Brattleville, and they trained there for a while, sometimes a month. And they would go through the basics of, uh, of, of the soldiering, then issued uniforms, and the first uniforms on them were green. They, they didn't have, there were all colors of uniforms, whatever the local people could, could make. And there were women that were sewing up green uniforms and, and gray uniforms and so on, and it was really no, nothing was the same. Uh, from Brattleboro, they, they went down and they were dispersed into the whatever areas the general wanted them to be, uh, depending on the companies and where they were from. Um, They, they weren't, the first soldiers that went to Bull Run were not really trained at all. They had done some marching. They, uh, even some of them didn't have, uh, weren't issued the proper weapons of the day. They drilled with wooden, uh, what do they call them? Quaker, Quaker, Quaker wooden muskets, uh, pretend muskets. So that they, they, uh, the, they knew a little bit about marching and that was about all. The tactics of those days was uh, Napoleonic tactics, and <clears throat> when uh, officers would go to West Point, they would train <coughs> them on these Napoleonic tactics, and the idea was to march in, in columns into battle, shoulder to shoulder, shoulder, and right up to the enemy and fire. And the reason for that was they had smoothbore rifles, and they were only they weren't rifles, they were actually shotguns, but they had no rifling in them to spin the bullet. And the accuracy was terrible. So they had to get close. And um, the soldiers would actually march touching elbows. So if you, and there were two ranks deep. And you stood with your comrade in arms and another one on this side and one in back of you and marched to within 30 or 40 yards of your enemy. Um, it took a lot of nerve, as you could almost bring it. Uh, but the problem was that they had invented rifling. And then what that is, <coughs> inside the barrel, and there's a spiral groove cut to make the bullet spin. And that increased the accuracy immensely. These weapons, these are 58 caliber Enfields. Uh, are accurate probably to 600 yards. So the first few, well I guess we might say a couple of years on the south and the north, both sides, they would shoulder irons and march right straight into battles, shoulder to shoulder, two ranks deep, and stand there and blaze away at one another. And the reason they didn't run was because their comrades were next to them, they were touching elbows, and they had been taught through all this drilling and so on that they couldn't run. And there were also file closers and officers behind them that would, I don't know of, of cases where they did, but they threatened to certainly shoot you if you turned and ran. So they were very, very brave men. Um, Later on in the war, after so many casualties, the, the South in particular, the South was, you have to realize, it's primarily on the defensive, especially after 1862 when they started being pushed back towards Richmond. And uh, so they would entrench. They learned to dig entrenchments and put up abattises, which were logs piled up and covered with dirt so that they had protection. And uh, so the, the, the southern soldiers were down in ditches, and the Union was attacking. And we had probably the worst generals that we could ever dream of. <laughs> and uh, so the, and they would march column after column after column right into the fire at Fredericksburg and at Spottonsville, Cold Harbor, all these big battles. It was. Sometimes they went to right shoulder shift. That's this position here. And then, you got light? <laughs> march, right, <laughs> march right into battle. Um, that way, when they got to the, the proper po po position, uh, you know, near enough to the enemy so they thought they could be effective, then the officers would, would sometimes they didn't
activity load their muskets, believe it or not, and they got to the, they would tell them to load. And the position to load is you throw the musket to the front, you reach in your, your cartridge belt here, hopefully you'll have it unbuckled by this time. You gotta remember these guys were, were 20 or 30 years old, so they had better hands than old guys like me. You reach in here and fumble around for a cartridge. Well, there's the, these are blank cartridges, by the way. But there is black powder in here, so please don't smoke. I'll pass one of those around. But uh, they would reach in the back and, and get the cartridge. And one of the ways to be deferred out of the service was not to have any teeth on the side of your face. If you couldn't bite that tab off, you were in trouble. So they spit this tab off and poured the powder down in the barrel and there was a, also a bullet. And I have a, a light round here with a bullet in it. You have a regular bullet. Yeah. That one, that's, that's what they were, these are authentic too. These <coughs> were just exactly what the soldier carried. There's not any variation. Then he would put the bullet down in the barrel. At least start it down there. And then pull out the ramrod ram it down, bring the rifle up, reach in his cat box, dig out a cap, <coughs> I won't do it, <laughs> put the cap on the nipple of the musket, I'll put that back, <laughs> then, the, then the sergeant would say ready, and he stood in a very strange stance and put with his heels together, aim, <coughs> Then he would say fire, and at the same time everyone would fire, and there would be maybe a hundred muskets in a row. Uh, and the back ranks, if you turn the, right, the back ranks, when they were doing this, they would load approximately this position. The back, back ranks bring their muskets right over the shoulder like this, so you have a wall of a lead flying at you. They all fired at once. Sometimes they would stagger their fire. They would fire by file, and it would be the first rank would fire, and the second rank would fire after they loaded. After the soldier loaded, you'd come to the soldier shoulder like this. The other rank would be ready to fire. They'd be ready. They'd fire. Then the next one would fire as they're loading. A good soldier could load and fire three times a minute. I probably couldn't. I'd try harder, but blanks you might make it. But to, to get a bullet seated uh, three times a minute is going pretty good. And here is the, the thing that got you. That's, uh, what, 540 grains, I believe, of lead. And they're, so, they're pure leather. So the, when those uh, bullets hit, a soldier, they not only, you know, tore the flesh, but they shattered the bone in just millions, of, they just destroyed the bone. That's why there were so many amputations. Because if you got hit in the hand, it would just shatter your arm and the whole works would just be in, in, uh, in ruin. Of course, they didn't have the ability, medical uh, technology to fix it. So they just cut it off. And there would be there'd be piles around the hospital tents. If you were lucky enough to get picked up and taken to a to a hospital tent, there would there'd be surgeons working endless hours just cutting off limbs. And there'd be piles of limbs outside the tent. And the poor soldiers were sitting there knowing they were next. And here's a bunch of legs and arms and, and um, there was very little uh, any kind of drugs for painkillers. Um, they would give them, they had, I believe, chloroform for them, but they didn't use it, they ran out. Uh, there were so many casualties. It's mind boggling when you stop thinking, start to think about the numbers, because there were uh, maybe a hundred thousand troops on the battlefield on one side. And the South would maybe have 60 or 70,000. They were normally outnumbered, but uh, not in their ability to 
fight. The Southern soldier was a terrific fighter. They had, they were also, you have to remember, they were on the defensive, so they had, they had their homeland that they were, they were worried about. They had their families, and so they, they fought real hard. And the soldier from the north was kind of adventuresome, uh, and to begin with, they didn't have the, uh, the will to fight maybe as much as the, the southern, southern children. That all kind of changed because uh, they saw their buddies getting shot and they, they wanted uh, revenge naturally. And the North went through several generals and I could go on about that, but that just were bloodthirsty. They'd send men into walls of fortifications that they couldn't <coughs> even dream of winning. Uh, at Fredericksburg, I think there were uh, well, 6,000 northern troops killed in less than an hour. They just marched right into the fray. And they would, they would be actually lined up in ranks on their face or backwards, and their comrades were walking over the top of them to get up there to fire their volleys. And God only knows why they did it. Um, I don't know if I could ever muster that much, that much bravery to do that. But the one reason was their comrade next to them, and they wouldn't run on him. And that was that was the big thing about the Vermont soldiers. They had so much pride, and uh, and they stayed with their comrades. They slept with their comrades. They would uh, be in, in winter quarters, six to eight in a tent. And the tent was a, called an A-tent. It might be, uh, it was what, six by seven feet long. And there would be six to eight men in there. So they were pretty close. And they also kept warm that way. You know, the, uh, we'll, Doug will talk about the equipment here in a minute. But uh, the Vermont soldier was incredible. That I'm sure that in every state you go to, the same story. But the proof is in the casualties. Because either they were really dumb and got themselves killed, or else they were so brave, they would just continue to follow orders. And <coughs> sometimes they actually didn't follow orders, they just went ahead anyway and charged the rifle pits or whatever. And I think it's true, I think it says in the, in the full duty there that Howard Coffin wrote, that Vermont never lost a battle flag in the, in the years, the five years of the war. They, uh, they, had, they lost them, but they retrieved them also. They went out and got the flag, which was represented their unit. And the color sergeants were the sergeants that carried the flag, and their life expectancy was zero. They would go down, another man would throw down his musket and run and grab the flag, raise it up, and off they'd go again because they rallied on the flag. And if there was no flag, then the battlefield became a chaos. Everyone was going in different ways. But you have to remember that this whole, if this was a battle scene here, the whole area would be engulfed in smoke. It's about black powder has got a wicked amount of smoke. You can see nothing. So if they could look to their right or to their left, to their right or to their left, and see a flag, <laughs> they would know that that was where they were supposed to be. So uh, there are several cases of Vermont soldiers that died by picking up the flag, the, the battle flag, and, and taking the troops ahead, being mowed down, another one picking it up, and so on and so forth, until they get to their their objective. And sometimes they, they win the day. They get right through the uh, rifle pits into the other side, and the generals would decide, well, that wasn't such a good move after all. And they'd move them back. They'd lose the ground that they just won. And the soldiers are getting crazy. They don't know why this is all going on. And the letters that, that we read uh, tell you about this, that, that they didn't like the generals. And then along come Ulysses Grant and things changed. And uh, before we get into that, 
I'll let them talk about the equipment here. And I'll help them if I can. <coughs> Basically, what you see I have on is the way all the soldiers were dressed after things became uniform. Uh, you can see the difference in the shade of blue. Like my, this is a sack coat. This is what was basically issued to them. What Grady's wearing is a frock coat. Uh, some of the, the regiments went into battle wearing those coats. That's all they would have. They wouldn't have this sack coat. Uh, that was considered more, though, of your dress uniform. The only difference between a dress uniform and a standard uniform is just your, just your outside coat. I believe that uh, when you were on parade, they figured the longer coat covered up the rest of the dirt underneath you, so you looked for the president or um, review in general. Uh, mine is a different pin. It should be the same, but it represents that under uh, contracts were sent out to various companies throughout the, uh, you know, the eastern seaboard uh, for the north to uh, make shirts and coats, everything. And all dye lots aren't the same. The color blue. This is supposedly the same color blue, but it depends what part or where you're from and what company you're running, what you feel is a cold block blue. So that's uh, one that this shirt represents the uh, different color. Uh, basically, they wore the brogans. It's a uh, leather shoe, all leather. The uh, soles are held together with wooden pegs. They're uh, very extremely slippery. No matter why they didn't have some way of uh, a wet field uh, when they were in battle, a little bit of mud, they had to be slipping and sliding all over the place. Uh, this is standard for all troops. The way you're sitting here, standing here dressed is uh, for the Vermont troops also. Now, Vermonter came out of the north here, weather like this, and everything dressed, these things are wool. Your underwear was wool. Your uh, shirt, your white shirt underneath was a heavy wool. Your overcoat was a wool. And you were sent down to Louisiana, you were in Tennessee, you were in 120 degree heat. Oh, whoa. Uh, this, was, this got your pants or wool, everything. And so, and this was, a, this was it. It wasn't just like a winter uniform. It, this was the uniform. And Brady went over the musket with you, so what I'll do take some of the stuff off and pass it. This was an issue canteen. They made two types. They made the bullseye canteen because they had the ribs in it. <coughs> uh, this is a smooth side canteen. This is uh, like what was issued with them and everything. It's all tin and solder. Uh, water lasts just about half an hour before it gets rusty. And, and that's what they put You can away. see the rust. Mine's a better example than the rust. <coughs> That uh, it would, if you put water in that right now and dump it out, it would be red. And I don't, I don't drink from it anymore. It is. And you can see that cork is just. Uh, Did you say this was like ribbed or ridged? No, uh, the bullseye. There's two different types. Oh, of I mean, there was, was that so it would slip? No, it was just a type of whatever the manufacturer put in it. He picked up the nickname as bullseye. The third Vermont carried the smooth side. The uh, interesting fact about you notice the canteen is covered in basically the same material as your coat is. Now as I tell you, this stuff is warm, very extremely warm. But once you get soaked inside with sweat, it acts as a cooler. You, you get only so hot, and then what it does, it, it creates a uh, well, it's not an insulating factor. It's uh, just a uh, Oh, you know how something you put your hand to get it wet and you hold it up in the breeze, the breeze that was warm feels actually cool to you. And that's the way the body acts underneath this wall. This was uh, the same as the canteens. The covers got wet and they actually kept the water cooler than it would have been if it was just uh, just the tin sides on it. This little bag right here, this is called your haversack. In all reality, probably this little bag was responsible for almost as many deaths in the Civil War as, the, as a, for the Northerners as a Confederate bullet. Reason being, right here, you're on the march for the next three weeks. This is your personal belongings. This is all the food you're going to have right here. You were issued raw, raw bacon, raw salt pork. Well, in 90 degree heat, how long does salt pork or bacon keep? These guys would march until they're ready to collapse. And they had, I mean, they'd eat their stuff raw. They'd eat the stuff.
stuff rot. Now, food spoiling in this bag. Originally, these bags were, as you'll see the inside, what they're white canvas. These bags were left white. Well, food spoiling in them and like that look pretty bad. They're all stained up. And the government said, well, we can't have our men marching in front of the president and the reviewing generals. To, uh, and having those ugly looking haversacks. The food's spoiling them. We've got to do something about this. They painted them black tar. <laughs> now I'm sure you all realize what happens if you're wearing a white coat on a hot day or you went to a black tarred coat on a hot day. Your food doesn't last half as long as I did because the heat becomes unbearable. So, but we look good on parade. The tar was melted. Well, they run and like that, you know, but they were dried on. Like, this is a tired bag, and of course, the heat won't. They had their plates and everything. These plates, not only did they eat off them, this is what you cooked your food on. And it was a lot of times, unless you were in a company mess where you had a cook, this is this is this was your fry pan, your bowl, everything like that. You'll notice I've had. Around. The bottoms of them are heavy. They're designed to be put into the fire. Same goes with your cup. You want your coffee, you want your tea, you put your water in, you set your cup into the fire. They're designed, they're heavy bottom. They were designed to uh, withstand a lot of heat. Is, is this, what is this? No, tin. tin. With a lead socket. <laughs> your habitat pain, like I said, you had your you had your food here and everything. And what might a soldier might have had carrying? I'll throw out He might have had some onions. <laughs> they're they're real good, but I have to cook them a lot. Especially fry them with pan. Yeah, we've been issued rice. Rice is very popular with them in the Civil War. And your all favorite hard shack. This basically, you might be expecting a German hard or is it? Now this is only a month old. Soldiers were issued stuff that were six months old. This hard shack. Pass it around. It's salt, it's flour, and salt, flour, and water. It's what it is. And as you can see, but this came in to the camps in cases. And the cases were just knocked apart, thrown out in front of your tent. If you happen to be in a company street or something, you just took uh, what was, you know, the issue probably. Oh, they might issue 30 squares. You had nine squares a day if you were on hardtack. Nine squares a day and water. And in a lot of cases, this is all they had week upon week. That and water. One thing that, that you have, it's incredible to think that a soldier could march 20 miles a day on hardtack, get up the next morning and march again. Uh, I have a hard time making a food called coffee break, you know, and, <laughs> and those guys survived on that and what they could steal. Uh, Procreate. Liberate. <laughs> Liberate, thank you. And also, the all favorite was salt pork that was carried with them. And everything. That would have been issued to, to them on, uh, you know, uh, That's fresh. Yeah. At least it's fresh. It's fresh. It's fresh. It's fresh. I have, uh, you have more? Yeah. I have some beef jerky that uh, would probably be sent home, or sent down. And the soldiers did get boxes from home, especially around holidays. And this is beef jerky that actually I made it. Um, and the thing they love the, love the most is like candy to them was an apple. Um, also, they get dehydrated food, such as dried apples. And these are 
these dried apples are a couple of years old, and they're they're fine. And they are fine. I mean, I don't mind eating. But they wouldn't be issued. No, they they might be, but they would probably come from home. Um, now I carried a little salt and pepper, which they could have gotten anywhere. This is my tea. I can't drink it. Tell them about the coffee, but. Uh, I have a little tea in these little bags, put them in my cup and boil it. They, uh, that's red cayenne pepper. That was a very, very popular uh, herb of the time. It was, uh, I guess, for basically like through the rest of the army life uh, in Vietnam, the uh, popular spice or herb was uh, hot sauce. The major reason was if you got some hot food, that would kill the taste of the food, because obviously it was not the top quality stuff. Toothbrush and tooth powder, which uh, as Grady mentioned earlier about loading your weapon, uh, dental hygiene was a very important thing during the Civil War. You lost these teeth, you were in trouble. You couldn't load your weapon, and with hardtack you couldn't spot, you couldn't eat. So it was very, very important to uh, have good dental hygiene. It's nice to know that they made a major effort on that side of the <laughs> 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 just dental hygiene started. <laughs> then they carried little pouches. You know, the soldier had a lot of time. There was, uh, you talk about the battles and like that, but 90% of his time was drilling and sitting around camp. And so he would uh, stitch himself together. A nice little thing to, you know, carry his pencils or stuff in and some will wear. And like that, keep them being bored. Use beeswax candles. Uh, I myself, I like, you know, I, I carry tea for the major same reason as Bernie says about the coffee. We do have coffee, but it's black as uh, your heel on your shoe and everything. But carry tea. The coffee was carried, you had bean, it was in bean form. And then you just put it in a small, wrapped it up in a cloth, and uh, with a butt of your rifle or a stone or something on the ground and uh, just throw it in the cup and throw it right in the fire. And with, with the cup on the fire and you blow it out and everything. Like that. Had salt issued to you. Uh, you'd had, if, when stuff was issued to you, you'd have like the salt pour. There's so much salt pour. You, had, you would had, uh, when they say they issued bread to you, it could be nothing more than two pounds of flour. Now this stuff was brought out. It wasn't brought out, handed to you in a little bag like this. You, know, you spread your poncho on the ground, and you come through and dump the stuff loose on your poncho. You had to carry a lot of little things like this and containers so they could scoop that stuff up and put it in, uh, you know, to carry it with them. Or else they had to scoop it all together and put it all in here. You had your coffee, and your flour, and your sugar, and your salt, because I didn't take this either that or start. It's, uh, it's really an, an for our form to to live out of a haversack. Um, we did this a little bit in the last reenactment. Um, but when you carry everything with you and you're on the march, you can't have it much, you know, because you've got to carry it. And um, somebody like Doug here has all the nice, neat things because he took time off. Some soldiers did that, but most of them were like me. And they'd throw stuff in their haversack and their silverware would be in the bottom here. And they lost their spoon, that's all they got. Got an old knife that took off from some poor rebel. And that's what they lived on. And the thing that, that I took for a side note that, that got to me down in Antietam was, when the sun goes down, if you haven't got your stuff together, you're in trouble. Because you can't find it, you can't see it, it's dark. So, of course, the soldier was going to bed there. But when you have a little candle for light, it gets it gets a little tougher to survive. So when you, the veteran <coughs> soldier, the veteran soldier in '63 and '64 and '65, he was he was good at this. I mean, he knew where his stuff was, and it wasn't clean. But he couldn't keep it clean. But he could survive on these little cans that he'd pick up somewhere and put his stuff in, and uh, and he was able to get by that way. 
but it is it's very difficult to think that you have all that you need right on your body because at any minute they might call you up and you've got a mark. Whereas uh, some groups, uh, you think like your artillery and stuff, they had artillery wagons, battery wagons. They were able to carry more stuff because they were, they could throw Anybody the want to try some beef jerky? No. Can I see the knife? They also, uh, the infantry man though, had to be, rely on everything was carried on his back. Uh, we packed this stuff away and I go to the map I don't know where it had it though. Excellent. Do you have figures on the percentage grade uh, or dog of uh, the men that went from Vermont out of the total of Vermont's total population? Where are you coming to that? Um, the percentage? I don't know. <coughs> or how many? Just numbers of how many? There were, uh, gosh, there is a, there is a, I heard I think it's, it's over. It's six, 66,000? No, 30, 30, 30, 32,000, I think, in that vicinity. I think it ran right around 10% of the of Vermont I was gonna population. That's say, because we only have half a million people in Vermont as we speak, mm -hmm. now. But back then, we probably, if you look at some of the stones markers around at the, like in the town of Callis, uh, where I'm from, if you look at the stone, the number of guys that went from to the Civil War from the town of Callis, yeah. there's no way the town of Callis today could put that many guys in what effort like that. They just stopped that money in that age group that could walk. Uh, the several stones in the Worcester Cemetery. Yes. Mm -hmm. The Are town of Woodbury, had, uh, allegedly, has the, the highest per capita of uh, soldiers in the war per population. And there were 264 out of, out of that town. And when you stop and think about that, they, were, they weren't all gone at once, but they were, there was a good number of them gone. And I know from one, one family, for instance, uh, the Hall family from up in West Woodbury, which is way up on the mountain, there were three brothers. <laughs> And two of them didn't come home. So, what happens back here? You know, there's still the cows to feed, the hay to get, the, the haying to do, um, all the chores, and the women did, and the kids, and the old men, and the old, old women had to do that. So, the hardship was back here also, and I'm sure that uh, there were probably a, a lot of people died because of that, you know, and, and there was probably a lot of starvation even, or at least real slim pickings. And in the South, they suffered terribly because yeah. uh, you have to realize that, that the North was industrialized and that they had the machinery to make urns, to make food, to make clothes, and it was, people made millions of dollars in this war. They, they actually profited from the, the war. And in well, the yeah. South, it was the other, other side of the corner. They didn't have the, the uh, factories and so on that were in Boston and Philadelphia and so on. And uh, so they, and of course, as you will learn, I guess, the, uh, the North uh, blockaded the coast all around of, of the South. So they couldn't get supplies very readily. They did have blockade runners that made it through there uh, for uh, ammunition and such things as like that. And these Enfield rifles got there somehow. But uh, um, they suffered dearly. And of course, they're, they, I, I can't speak to that, but I assume that, that the uh, plantation owners weren't used to work. And the slaves ran away, or after the Emancipation Proclamation, they they went north. They and the, the, they called them contraband, and they fell in with the troops, and they followed the troops, and they do laundry, and they dig ditches. They uh, would do all kinds of things, you know, like that. They called um, them contraband. They called them contraband, um, and they were just uh, free slaves that that uh, <coughs> were trying to be free, and, the, and the, so they felt they, they suffered terribly. Um, we were talking
talking about hygiene when Doug was going to brush his teeth there. <laughs> in the camps, in the, in the big camps around Washington, uh, what do you do with the sewage? You know, here you have 100,000 men. And that's just, it could be 60 or it could be 150,000. And what they did is they dug what they call sinks. They might dig it up here on the hill. And then the camp was down here. And they, all they were was just a big <coughs> trench with some logs set up so that you could set on. <coughs> and uh, the stench was terrible. And it's no wonder that your grandfather gets sick because um, the uh, cleanliness was not an issue back then. And when, uh, when it got too bad, so that the officers, which usually picked their spot for their tents, were downwind or were upwind, I guess you should say, so that they wouldn't smell that so bad. But the, the, the average poor soldier was in that in their in their camps in the winter camps and so on. And, on, and of course, the other thing was cholera. And cholera was uh, caused from from horse manure. They think. I guess they didn't know now. But uh, <coughs> you have 50,000 horses and mules and cows. They would drive whole herds of cows to supply these men with, with beef. And uh, what do you do with it? Where can you? Well, I suppose some of it went in the Potomac River. I don't know. But in the spring, when it would rain, all that filth would run right down through the camps. <laughs> and uh, what they do is move. They'd get up, and uh, some officer would general would say it's time to move, and they move two miles down the road. They'd let it dry out, and then the next group would come in, and they'd camp right there in the same spot. So, a lot good. <laughs> Go Talking about uh, earlier, you were mentioning about percentage wise, and like that, getting into what, hap what happened to small towns. Uh, it wasn't Vermont, a Vermont town, I believe it was a town from Tennessee. But to give you an idea, back then, of what this was like, uh, back then, different from today, it's like if we're all here, we enlisted in the service. If all of us ended up in the same outfit, it would be very rare. Two of us ended up in the same outfit, it would be very rare. They'd divide you up. They'd send you somewhere, they'd send you somewhere. They'd divide us up. We wouldn't all be together. Back in the Civil War, you went in as a group, you stayed as a group. You represented, you know, your hometown, you were, uh, that's one thing that kept them together, yeah. too. You are very close. Well, uh, I forgot what battle it was, but in uh, this town in Tennessee, the entire, entire adult male population of that town was killed in the first 20 minutes of this battle, Pacific Battle. Now that's your butcher, your farmers, your loggers, anything that made this town work. The first 20 minutes of the battle, the entire adult male population was wiped out. The town was wiped out. So there was no one to keep the town going when you came back. The town ceased to exist. The women went off and you know, married other people. They moved out. The town actually was deserted. But that is, that's how it was. Uh, the casualties unbelievable. And as they marched in and like that, I mean, it was just a, you know, like, they talked like, oh, I believe that, uh, okay, like in uh, uh, Vietnam, the casualties were 50 some odd thousand. That's a lot of men. That's over the course of a number of years. Three days at Gettysburg, it was over 50 thousand. Uh, there were some battles, to, uh, 2,000 men in the first 20 minutes. Yeah. And so that's, you know, it's just, as Grady mentioned before, fighting like they did in Europe back in the 1700s, but you have modern weapons. Civil War was actually the founding of the age of the modern weapon, even though that doesn't look like anything like the muskets, <coughs> don't, they don't look like anything they would call modern, but they were. It was the dawning of the modern weapon. This is also what the soldier had here. This was his knapsack. Well, in 
in this, he had to carry everything else that he didn't carry in the haversack. Usually this would weigh up to 80 to 100 pounds. He had to carry, you know, he was expected to maintain this. This stuff was issued to him. Uh, you had to take it, you had to throw it. I mean, it, you got sick of carrying it, it was hot and everything. Well, I don't need what's in here. I can survive with my blanket. If I'm carrying this thing, make life easier. I'll throw this away, throw it in the ditch. Well, come reckoning day, when you get out, you were responsible. You had to turn this back into the government. If not, you were, it might stand a chance of, well, you just volunteered for another two years. Oh, right. Or you got to come up with some money. So what would you do? Well, you scrounge around, you try and find one. They had people that sold stuff to the soldiers that followed the camps. They were merchandisers. <laughs> they called them sutlers. The sutlers' wagons would come down behind the army when they were on the move, picking all this stuff up. Sooner or later, you had to go to a sutler and buy the stuff back. It was a great business. <laughs> Things like your... Uh, now, would you carry that in battle? No, they probably, well, it depends where or, you know, where they were going in and everything. Uh, chances are enough, they drop them. But you carry the small. The small stuff you would carry. Do <coughs> you have yours numbered? They had numbers, the soldiers were numbered and they would they'd make a pile. They knew they, they, they usually knew a uh, soldier could tell that there was a battle pending the next day by what kind of activity the officers were doing. You know, they, they knew they were close to a battle and the officers were all scurrying around and they were up at night and doing maps and stuff. They knew they were, they were going to get it. So they, in the morning they'd pile their stuff and then hope that somebody would pick it up and bring it to them if they went on the map. This is, you just slip into that. Yeah. You know, we wouldn't lend it to be down in jail. No. <laughs> okay. So this is a little big on Grady, but this, is, this was issued to you, and, but you turned it in in the spring. You didn't keep it all the time. So this is something you carried. You hopefully had a lot of use for it. In the winter time it was. It's considered what they call the great coat. And um, you see it's caked, it's doubled. Or it's real good. The way well, it was designed, it's very well designed. Actually one of the better things the government ever came out with. You did have the cape that could be used as a hood. Also on the long nights, if the wind wasn't blowing and it was a little dreary, it, it sheltered your sh shoulders a little better. Uh, it was designed, you know, to cover you as you as you sat, covered your legs well, the arms on it. Uh, they did away with a lot of problems with mittens. They always had big cuffs on them. You carrying something that was cold on your hands in the wintertime, you just pulled the cuff down. This is why they were designed that way to do that. Uh, it had a lot, a lot of things. I guess this is why they, uh, they wanted them back in the spring, so they give them back to you come fall. The coat could be by, uh, if you didn't have it on, you flopped the uh, hood up, laid the hood in, buttoned it up, and buttoned the hood inside the cape here. You could actually pull it up over your feet, and it was uh, going into it the bottom side up. It was an early version of a sleeping bag. So it has extra bedding at night and stuff like that. Uh, but like I said, that was uh, that was taken away from me. So <laughs> one of the jobs of the soldier was picket duty, but they loved it. And their job was to go out a mile or so into the towards the, the enemy and stand in duty, stand picket there. And so he had to be ready for about anything. And rain is, was. I mean, they had, they had uh, that was short to your ponchos, but uh, the army would read that they didn't wear them. So, <laughs> that they were, you know, uh, not readily available. So they'd be out there standing, uh, what was it, uh, 24 hours on, probably 24 hours off, alone. Yeah, and maybe there would be another picket over at the manor or somewhere. They're just watching. And uh, so they had to have all this stuff just to survive. Because it got pretty cold out there. There were several occasions where there was, you know, eight or ten inches of snow. I'll take it off. Sorry, you for it. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, this backpack, like I said, it weighed, would weigh between 80 to 100 pounds. Things he carried, well, was very something very nice to have all the time. 
was reading material. So no matter how old the paper was, he cherished it. That was put on to the next yes, give it to the next person, passed it around and everything. And they uh, you know, something to read. Didn't make any difference what it was. Uh, as Grady mentioned, the pawn shop. <coughs> Rubberized canvas. No, basically all it is with a hole cut in it from over your neck. Well, why didn't the army want, want them to use that? They were, well, it's <laughs> pretty valuable, don't they? Don't yeah, know. they don't, it was worth more to them than the, than the uh, soldier. soldier. Uh, this is primarily what it was used for was a ground floor. That you lay on the <coughs> ground uh, Also, that's what your rations were dished out on. Yeah. They come and dump your flour and everything else right on the ground right there. And a lot of them carried other, you know, they might have another form of ground cloth. I myself, I have a canvas, no shelter hat, and everything used for a ground cloth. A lot of times, if you're using just shelter hats, was playing those. I got the shelter hat. Oh, yeah. I got the ground shelter hat. Uh, shelter hat doesn't have an end on. The tent is about, well, you'll see when I unfold it, but it's a little bit shorter. <coughs> this in, he wouldn't have carried the second <coughs> issue shirt. This is considered an issue shirt. The shirt he might have carried would have been something sent from home. His issued shirt, like this one I'm wearing, is what he, you know, worn a lot and everything. This here is, uh, we're kind of proud of it. <coughs> it's about five years of research gone into this shirt. This shirt is the exact material, the exact stitch, Everything's exact what was issued to the Union soldier. Like I said, it's five years of research done into this shirt. Now this is the same thing I have on. And I'd like to pass the shirt around. You just feel now this is remember you got wool clothing over the top of that. Like I said, his shirt set from home would have been a lot nicer. Just a you know uh, a lot of them were were a flannel shirt and like that. It would have been for you know if you happen to be going to a church or something like that, you might have thrown that off. This is your shelter hat. Every man was issued a shelter hat. What it is, is exactly what it stands for, is half the shelter. And if you're as big as Doug, <laughs> this is half. Now this, uh, it stood about this high. About this high. Button together with the other half and went down there. That was for two men. Ooh, and the ends were open. Yeah, that's what the uh, ground cloth would be used for. Mm -hmm. if, the, if it was rain, which it rain, these don't hold water. I mean, they drip. Right? Oh, there was any such thing as waterproofing or anything like that. And as you notice, the reason for the. Yeah, as you see, that's on the ground. And this much of me, one end or the other is going to stick out. Rain, snow, cold, it's like that. It's what they eat. Yeah, you know, I had to carry stuff to kind of throw it together. What about putting the raincoat over that? Would that work? Uh, what would they have done is put it over the ends. Yeah. The stakes were something you'd gone through the woods and cut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they would do all kinds of, in certain camps, uh, when they were on the bat in battle or at the Battleground, they'd make shebangs. They call them shebangs, and it would maybe there would be three or four of these hitched together, so that they could get together for warmth. For one thing, I mean that they, they suffered terribly with cold, and uh, sudden storms would come up, and, and rain and sleet and freeze, you know, and they couldn't get away from. Them. Um, they, they stole firewood. They actually tore down houses. Firewood. Part of the South suffered terribly that way. Uh, uh, if there was an encampment of 100,000 men, and there was the, the village of Plainfield would be stripped. Uh, if there was a shortage of firewood, they'd take the house right down. I would too. Yeah, these are winter camps. 
that I'm talking about there. Uh, because you wouldn't have time, they, they would take bench rails or any kind of wood to burn because you had to cook your pork. And that pork that, that uh, Doug had, he, he'd probably cook it all at once. Did you say that? Throw it in his haversack and they eat it for three, four days. If he left it raw, it would probably kill him. They would tear down a house in the middle of the winter for plywood instead of going in it and using that. Well, it might be our house you didn't want them in it. No, they would. They, the officers wouldn't let them move in there. Well, they had to stay in the camp because they didn't know when they were going to be attacked. So, mm -hmm. so they would have to be together. Then all important to him was his wool blanket. This is basically, this is a marina wall, and uh, it's very common to what was carried. They had different varieties, they had little red blankets, they had gray blankets, they had the all white blankets. And even quilts that uh, the women folks at home would make and send down, you know, quilts and things like that. They would receive a lot in the mail of these different items, but the thing was, is you had to be prepared, you know, if you had it, did you want to put up with carrying it? You know, did you want to march 30 miles? When the troops went from Washington to Gettysburg, Washington, D.C. to the Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, it was actually done at almost a run. Yeah. You were told. It was uh, 21 miles. Yeah. And it was basically at a run. You fell out, something happened, hey, maybe someone will come along and help you. You were told. You, wherever you fall, where you're going to lay, we got to move the arm. And that was uh, in one case there is where, in full duty, it re uh, refers to as the problem with a Vermonter or a Vermont unit was that they would outmarch any other unit. In reality, they outmarched. They had problems with them because they were getting way ahead of the rest of the army when they were just moving the men. A lot of times they put Vermonters, the Vermonters in with the supply wagons to hold them up, slow them down. Well, going to Gettysburg, it was uh, Cedric, who was the general, I believe he said it. Um, uh, no. Put the Vermonters ahead to keep the column well formed. Closed up. Closed up. And uh, that meant the, the rest of you guys have got to keep up with the Vermonters. The word, that's the pace we're setting. Bring them out and set the pace, and so they could move them in. And it was, uh, so that's a little known fact how the Vermont soldier was. He could move out March and any, any other outfit going. Another point of that same march was uh, as they were marching, it was very hot weather. It was great. Fourth of July, you know, they were hot. Yeah. And the guys would have their canteens and they quickly drank their canteens and they were gone. And uh, as they were going, the general, General Standard, I believe, wouldn't let them stop for water. Because they would normally stop at a creek or anywhere or a big pot of muddy water and fill their canteen. But they knew that they had to get to Gettysburg. They had to get there because Buford had held off uh, the, the uh, rebel army to gain the high ground. And that was a big thing in the Civil War, is get to the high ground. Because if you got there, you were shooting down on the enemy and they had to come up the hill towards you. And so, the that was the whole turning point of any battle was to get to the fortified positions. So, uh, as Doug said, Cedric was, was pushing the men to get to the, the to Gesper. And they had, they ran out of water. And one of the officers, and I can't recall his name right now, took it on himself to get a, a group of, of Vermont soldiers. And they broke ranks, and they went to a brook, and they filled their can all the canteens of everyone that was in the area, you know, around them. And they came back and passed out the canteens, and they were relieved, of course. General found out about it, and he court-martialed the officer for, for disobeying an order. He told them they couldn't stop. So what they, they couldn't, they won the battle, so they couldn't do much right then, but he took away his sword. That was a an honor thing. If you didn't have your sword and you were an officer, you would didn't look so great. So this uh, officer went right into battle, the second Vermont, right into the heart of it, you know, around some campfire somewhere. He picked up a hatchet. And if you go down to the state house, that I think 
there's a painting there, and there's a man standing with a hatchet to go into battle. I don't believe they ever got into hand-to-hand -hand fighting here at Gettysburg at that point. But that's the kind of, uh, of, of uh, bravery or foolishness, whichever way you want to look at it, that they, that they uh, show. And the Battle of Gettysburg, you probably, if you study the, that part of that, or, yeah. But I'll bet you don't know what General Standard did. No, I don't know who General Standard did. Yeah. Well, the second remark was, was first was picketed down in front of the lines. Picketed means they had a battle line down in front. And they were, and this is just generally speaking, they were being attacked by the, the Confederates. So they had to fall back. And they fell back to the battle line. The picket, General Pickett's charge came. And they were coming up in a full battle line over a mile away, coming across the full battle line line after line, two, two ranks, you know, shoulder to shoulder, mm -hmm. marching right into the battle, and everyone was holding their fire on the Union side. The, the artillery was firing and taking big gashes out of the line. Uh, Doug will talk to you about artillery here in a little while. The men were just following like crazy, but they kept coming and kept coming and kept coming, and they thought, if the man next to me fell out, I would Holes on the colors. If the flag was there, you slid over, tell you where elbow to elbow, and everybody else did right down the road. Then the file closers in back would come in and they'd take the hand position. And they'd just keep going and keep going and keep going. And then back of you would be rows of dead. And uh, you just kept going. But, anyways, Pickett was charging across the battlefield and coming up the hill to the stone wall where the uh, Michigan and Pennsylvania was. But on the picket's right flank and the Union left was General Standard and the 2nd Vermont. And they were actually missing him as the battle lines came. They were missing him, sort of. And coming, the most pressure was on his General Standard's right. So Hancock was in back. He was a uh, colonel, I believe. And he saw the opportunity to swing out and do a right wheel, which is these battle lines stay straight. And the man on this side is like marching in the high school band. This man here is taking small steps. The guy on the very end is almost running to keep up and to keep the straight line right around like this. So Hancock was about to run, ride his horse down or run down and tell General Standard to do this. Well, Standard being a Vermonter dollar, not a court. <laughs> so he, he, he called the orders, and the second Vermont marched right out and did a right wheel and was firing right into the sides, the flanks of Pickett's men. And it was what they call a withering fire. It meant that everybody was getting killed. I mean, they. You just cannot imagine what the volley sounds like, and I never did until this year. <coughs> Books describe it as ripping of sheets, <coughs> like that. And a 58 caliber, I don't know if Goddard would like it if we fired out here or not, we could. But a 58 caliber makes a big noise. But when it is in, in, in the hundreds, it sounds like ripping sheets, <coughs> like that. So when they go out there and, and fire a ball, maybe the front rank, I'm not sure how they did it, the front <coughs> rank would fire a ball, it would be zip, and down would go a bunch more men. Then the front rank reloads quickly. The second rank right over their shoulders and zip. So you're getting maybe six shots times a hundred men a minute. You can imagine what happened. I mean, they missed. Lock. It was a lot of missing. They didn't always hit their target. But Pickett's charge was repulsed right then. That was what ended them. The history books don't really tell you that. But it's a it's the truth. And it will be it'll be brought out more in this uh, little book that we're talking that uh, nine months to Gettysburg because it was a nine months cruise that did it. But it's pretty ghastly business. 
Uh, also, in his knapsack, soldier would have carried his personal stuff, a wallet with his personal papers in it, maybe some identification, uh, in case he had this with him and he'd get killed. Uh, these two items here, <coughs> what they refer to as a housewife. Had your needle and thread, and like that. Soldier was responsible for his own uniforms, and heaven help the soldier that showed up at inspections that had a hole or a tear in his uniform, or a wear, you know, worn out like that, and then issued new uniforms. You had to, uh, like I said, he was responsible. He had to know how to sew. Of course, a lot of these old boys, like especially Vermont, they knew how to sew. Um, <laughs> If you carried some spare rounds, you had 40 rounds in your cartridge box. You would have carried upwards to 20 rounds separate in, in his knapsack. In case he, you know, they were issuing rounds, they had them, you know, 40 rounds, it's 40 bullets, right? 40, 40 bullets. Firing three in a minute, you'd be out of ammunition. Yeah, well, you also were going, also, the commander would be telling you when to fire. And you might be standing there for 20 minutes without firing. Some gun oil. You had, you had to keep the thing spotless. You notice our muskets aren't blue. They come through blue. Uh, originally, some of them came through blue. The idea was, it's not being blued, is as you were marching in, say, see, uh, you were did it. Yeah. Uh, you're marching in, and say there's a group of about uh, 20,000 of you. The sun hitting this and glancing off of it was very demoralizing to the enemy. It, it really stood out. This is a big thing, demoralized you know, each other right. like that. And uh, you know, that's why, and this is, they were just steel. And one damp night outside, these things turned into nothing but a ball of rust. So keep, they had to keep your muskets clean. And, and you didn't have uh, these caps, I'll pass one around. Each one of them, they go on the nipple of the musket. Go right on that. Each one of them had to be pinched. And if you're 20 years old, it's not a job. But when you get old and your fingers are thick and numb, you pin pinch that cap so it'll stay on the musket. Because you're going through different movements with the musket. And if it comes off, it might mean your life. Because the, the other guy might have his, his cap on. So what Doug had there was he took it away. A little package of caps, and you'd have to take every one of them and pinch them before you put them in your cap box. And it wasn't it wasn't an easy little chore on the battlefield. So you'd have those done. I would, yeah, mm -hmm. I would too. <laughs> <laughs> but you had to open up a new new package on the battlefield. Also, yeah. they were these uh, these black powder rifles have got a tremendous amount of residue. You know, they're dirty as can be, and uh, I mean they, they stink like. They had cleaning rounds, and I don't have one. In I should have brought one. Yeah, but the cleaning round had a like a washer on the bottom of it that would actually cut the the soot in the barrel. And these muskets would get so foul that they couldn't load, couldn't get the ball, the ball the, or the mini ball down the barrel. So what would they do? They throw it down and grab another. And uh, sometimes, you know, uh, you've heard stories, all kinds of stories about what they would do, but generally speaking, he's got another one because there were hundreds of them laying on the battlefield. And they also got the, the ammunition from the soldiers. <coughs> uh, Did they all carry the bayonets? Yes. Want to talk about the bayonets? Yeah, the bayonet actually. Uh, it, it looks like a very formidable weapon and like that. The thing was is that actually there are very few deaths attributed to the bayonet or actually wounds. Uh, exactly why, uh, you see in the movies, everyone going to battle with bayonets on the pictures, the paintings and like that. That's more for being glorified, you know, because you had it like that. The bayonet was used a lot for parades and also for stacking arms, the pyramid of arms. We need at least three muskets to do it. But, and that's a major purpose of it. And like that, they were used in bayonet charges, but there weren't that many people killed by the bayonet. Oh, they, 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 in the
scope of things, you know, of a hundred thousand men, there weren't many, but there were, there were occasions. They did maneuvers to stop cavalry charges. Mm -hmm. If you were a foot soldier and uh, the cavalry was charging you, you fire your musket, and if that didn't work, then you, you they had ways that they, they stood in like groups of stars with the musk with the bayonet out. And the idea was to kill a horse, and you could kill a horse with that by just stabbing in the in the uh, neck. But it, uh, they also it, in certain uh, let's see, Mary's hut was a was a big. Uh, the Vermont soldiers were in the sixth court. Uh, General Sedgwick. Uh, and, it, and at Mary's Height, that you might read about, they actually were up against a wall of logs, and uh, Samuel Pingy stood on the top of the abatis, firing his musket down into the rebels <coughs> on the other side. They'd hand him another rifle, and he'd fire again. And I think he, he was up there for 10 or 12 shots before he was shot down. Then they'd also they'd just take their musket <coughs> Fire and throw them right over the abatis, hoping that they would stick into someone down on the other side. And they club, they use muskets as clubs. You know, and it, I mean, they, they become useless after you're, <coughs> they're fouled. And the soldiers got face to face, and the only thing left was the musket. So a lot of people got clubbed with them. And they did, they have certain drills that I just hate to do. These types of actions to train and what were the others? I can't remember now. It was a, a bad end drill. And yeah. it's, I, it was done in the Civil War in French. All the name is in French. Yeah. And it was a standard operating uh, drill, which was how I them would hear with everything going on, what to do it is beyond yeah. me. It's just that it's just so rattling on a battlefield and like that with uh, reenactments today. And we're doing it with a tenth of the men that actually were at the battles and everything. One thing was uh, done, you know, they, were, they had to be very disciplined. And as Brady went through the uh, uh, order to fire, everything was done. Okay, load, brought it down, everything. You pulled your ramrod. And now here's the, tr the Confederates are charging you. They're right here. They're on the other side of that building. They're getting closer. The fire. Now your act to be would be you brand your round. Well, lay, stick this in the ground and forget about putting it back in. And get the gun out, get it primed so you're ready to shoot again. Well, the problem was with that. See, I stuck that in the ground like that. All of a sudden, the general said, or the sergeant says, "Okay, over here." So I go over here. I pull up. I fire. Oh, ramrod's over there. The gun is now useless. So they had to be just everything, and that was what came through the training. And actually, that was one thing, probably the only thing McCullough uh, mm -hmm. did that was good was the fact he was a disciplinarian on training, drill, 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 constantly until it came. It was second nature to him, and that that was one thing. He wasn't a fighter, but he just wouldn't commit to anything. He wouldn't commit his men and like that. But he did drill. He did drill and drill and drill. But you can understand a, a general on either side when he he's in command of these troops that he's been there with all winter. And they've been you know, he's been drilling them, they he hasn't met them personally, but he recognizes their faces there. They go to battle. Maybe maybe a tenth of them come back. And he's in his tent there, and he's got to be a general. But he, you know it's got to hurt to lose the hell out of him. The next time he goes to battle, this is, I think this is one of the big drawbacks that McClellan had. He, he can see those hundreds of thousands of soldiers getting killed and wounded. And to actually say, go again, he couldn't do it. Ulysses S. Grant could. He was probably the only thing that kept the, the rebels from being up here. <laughs> but uh, he, in the uh, 
advanced towards Richmond. Uh, I don't know if you've read about the wilderness, but the wilderness was fought in, in the woods, virtually in the woods. And the smoke was so thick they couldn't see a thing. And the troops got disoriented, they were lost, they didn't know where they were, they were firing on their own people. There were casualties that were just tremendous. And he was, uh, Ulysses Grant lost heavily. What did he do? Instead of, the, the, you got to remember that the, the rebels were entrenched. Instead of going at them again, they retreated, and then they turned basically south. They were headed for Richmond. And all this, the, all of the, the war so far up to them was geared around getting to Richmond. South was trying to get it at Washington and, and capture Washington, and the North was trying to get to Richmond, the capital of the South. So this, this battle kept going on. It was uh, started out at, uh, at the Wilderness, Cold Harbor, Spottensville, and tremendous losses. Uh, Mary's Heights, Fredericksburg was uh, 6,000 in less than an hour. Grant just kept just putting them in. And he had decided that the only way to beat the rebel was to, to out recruit them. And up here in Vermont, the call would come for another 300,000 troops. So he didn't throw 300,000, but the they kept sending the men, sending the men. And at the end of the war, soldiers like Doug had all the equipment. And most of the time, they had reasonably good food. The South was starving. They had nothing. They were, they were eating uh, just corn. And they, they didn't have anything to just live on, hardly. And the only way to feed them was to take the food away. And so Grant kept swinging south. You have a big battle that's Spottensville. They retreat away from that because they knew they couldn't get through. Go south. And, and all the time Lee was winning the race, he'd go to the next battle. And then Grant would have a, a shoot out there and they'd move down. And they'd move down. And all the time getting closer and closer to Richmond. And when they got to Petersburg, it was a trench warfare because they couldn't go no further. And there was no way around to speak. <coughs> General Butler was south of Richmond, and Butler was in that old case of one of those good generals from the Union. But uh, Ulysses S. Grant was right, right there, and that was where the breakthrough came at Petersburg, with the Vermont troops from the Sixth Corps breaking through the line and and starting the trip and took Richmond. Uh, Lee and Davis and had to retreat from Richmond. They left the city, burned it themselves. It wasn't the Union that burned it. Uh, and then they went to Sailor's Creek and then to Appomattox Courthouse for the surrender of the farm. But it was this dogged determination of Grant that kept it going. And it was the poor soldiers that paid the price. And then, of course, in the Shenandoah Valley, it was Sheridan. Sure that uh, Grant told him to go down the Shenandoah val Valley and make it so that a crow would have to carry his own provender, his own food, to get across the valley. And that's exactly what they did. They burned everything that was there. If there was a farmhouse 
Grant had already done this once before when he took Vicksburg. They, they did away with their provisions. They lived off the land. So all the way from, from Tennessee to Atlanta, they did whatever was necessary for their supplies. And if, if uh, as they called them secessionists, uh, because it was seceding from the Union, uh, if they would share their stuff, they might not burn their building. But if they put up a fight, if there was some news that these people had, had uh, an officer in the, in the rebel army, they'd burn it. And that you have to realize that it's the magnitude of it is just hard for me to, to understand, but it, when you take 100,000 men and there's 20,000 going down Route 2, there's another 30,000 down 302, and over on Route 14 there's another 100,000, which are a huge number. It's just, it's just a congregation of all these troops. Uh, taking everything that was there, they left virtually nothing. Earlier you, you were talking about how like a lot of the Vermonters probably joined up not to like not because of the racism and because of the whole thing about freeing slaves, but a lot joined up to kind of get off the farm and get out of Vermont. How how do you feel in the perspective of the people who are leading this, like the politicians and the generals and the people like that? Have you done any well, uh, even Abraham Lincoln wasn't totally against slavery. Uh, in his uh, writings, he he wanted to abol abolish slavery, but he was willing to make concessions. When they before Fort Sumter was fired on, they were trying to to uh, to get over this problem without a big war. And he was willing to make concessions so that uh, certain states could still keep their slavery and certain other ones. Any new state that came into the Union would have to be free. Uh, so I think that to begin with, at the very beginning, you've got to remember that <coughs> a lot of these soldiers have never seen a black person. They, you know, in the old Vermont, they'd never seen a black person. The Civil War wasn't only about slavery. No, it wasn't. It wasn't only about slavery. Uh, um, commerce was one, of course, the, uh, the cotton. What would have changed the Civil War, even if, I mean, the, the slavery probably, even if the Civil War hadn't happened, was the cotton gin. Yeah. It industrialized the, uh, the ability to to make cotton easier and they didn't have to have all the labor. But, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a lot of things, but to the <coughs> basic soldier, which I, you know, simple soldier, it was a way to get out of Vermont. And they had been, uh, I don't know if you, any of you have been to old time camp meetings, but they were, had been sort of brainwashed into thinking that it, it was the right thing to do to free the and Uncle Tom's Cabin was another book and, and, uh, that, that helped um, to spur these soldiers into going down and they wanted to see the world. What's the story of the uh, sleeping that sent it? Yeah, William Scott. Uh, I need to leave uh, after, after work. <laughs> well, I shouldn't be working myself. <laughs> great. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Uh, William Scott was uh, one of five <laughs> brothers that were uh, from Groton, Vermont. And uh, I'm not sure exactly how many, but I think that four of the brothers were killed in the Civil War. Uh, William Scott was a heck of a nice guy. He was a, a hardy guy, and he was uh, very friendly, and the troops liked him a lot. And he'd do anything for them. And he had stood his sentry duty, his picket duty. And so he was 24 hours out, out standing picket duty, and one of his comrades was sick, and they were looking for somebody to take his place. So William said, okay, I'll do it. So he went out there, wherever it was, and he fell asleep, and he got caught. Which you can understand, because it's...
first I gotta say one little thing about Vermont Soldier, which I love. But when they were on picket duty, it was lonely. But they'd be out there in the woods in the dark and they couldn't see anybody and they'd be going, Woohoo, woohoo! Hooting like out. <laughs> and then somebody would be going, oh, 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 like a like a mule. So they were communicating back there, and I love it, because that I, I'm a little bit like that. <laughs> but anyways, William was on Piccadilly, and he fell asleep. Well, this was in, in uh, 60, 1862, and the generals, as a general rule, the soldiers weren't too care, they weren't too worried about rebels coming across. They were pretty tough, they didn't get with anything. And the generals were worried that the, the Union generals were worried that there'd be a strike and they would come across the bridges and go towards Washington and, and uh, take Washington. So they wanted to set an example. And this is what has come down through the history. So they picked they, they make an example of somebody. So poor William was out there on his second 24-hour shift and he had to get some sleep. And they and they caught him and they put him up in court martial. And he was destined to be shot. And his own comrades were picked to shoot him on the firing squad detail. And as I remember, they actually walked him out onto the to the area and sit, stood him in the back of his coffin or set him on you know, they had a coffin right in the back of him. And Luckily, we, uh, there were people that were working to get his uh, get him let off, and Lee, uh, Lee uh, Lincoln, pardoned him, so he survived that. But it was a way of putting fear in the hearts of the rest of the troops. What it was all about. <coughs> it wasn't that he was a terrible sleeping sentinel. He was asleep, but he was he was. The reason he was is because he'd done so much duty. And so William uh, went on to the battle and they went on the Peninsula Campaign down on in, down the Potomac and up, I think it's the James River, onto the Peninsula, the Vermont Brigade. And they were starting to push towards, always towards Richmond, always trying to get Richmond. Rather than fighting the rebel army, they were trying to get it written. And, and William Scott was one of the ones at Lee's Mill. The Vermont Brigade was on the one side of this dam, and the rebels were entrenched in rifle pits on the other side. And, what, 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 I forget. Yeah. Um, it would be the first Vermont. Anyways, uh, <coughs> the order was given to charge across that that uh, that dam and take the rifle pits on the other side and hold them and reinforcements would come in. Well, they did. The Vermont Brigade waited across. They take their cartridge boxes and cap box and hold it over their head, march way across the water and across the dam. They what, the bullets were fired, falling in that water, so it looked like boiling water. And they took the rifle pits away from the Confederates and they held them. And there was there was terrific slaughter. Uh, they were there for a, like 15 minutes or three quarters of an hour, and no reinforcements came. They sent back across the river. Where are our reinforcements? And this was. Uh, was it? Burnside? Burnside. I, no, I'm not sure the general at this moment. Lost it, but they didn't send reinforcements. So the Vermonters stayed there. They stayed in those pits and they fought and they fought and they ran out of ammunition. Of course, no one would bring it across that water. So they had to retreat. So they went back across that water. And William Scott was shot through the stomach and on the way back. And they wouldn't, one thing about the, the, the generally speaking, the Civil War soldiers, they wouldn't turn their back on the enemy because it was 
was not uh, not honorable to die with a bullet in the back. They'd rather get hit in the front. So he went backwards as best as he could have. The whole troop went through. And as I said, the water was actually boiling with muskets fired into that water. And he was shot in the, in the belly and he died a couple of days later. Right? What happened when he was gone. But uh, his family, I think, lost four brothers. And they were, if you go on Route 302, there's a monument there. And that's where their farm was. And the parents moved out. And no one knows where they went. Uh, it's also in, I, think, I believe it's in full duty. They, they couldn't run the farm because they didn't have the brothers to do it. And the old folks couldn't do it. So they moved out. They probably didn't even settle. They just moved. Uh, just a few summers ago, find something in the East Palace. Uh, that, that, Doug will get into that with the artillery. Yeah, that was, uh, they found out that Curly Pitkin, who was from East Montpelier, became the adjutant general of the army, and that was, his job would be for supplies. And uh, his farm was up by the uh, North Calais uh, Memorial Building on there somewhere. And apparently he had some some artillery shells left over from the war that he must have got up there somehow or else maybe they had a militia group of not as we know it today, but a militia group of soldiers that were firing those or something. They found them in Nelson Palm. Number ten. Number ten, sorry. Yeah, cannibals, right? Yeah. yeah. Actually they were exploding around. Well, the divers found out. The one thing about black powder, once it's got soaked and dried out, mm -hmm. it's very unstable. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the divers that we have to luck out in our, in our group, uh, one of the guys ended up at a conference down in Massachusetts, sitting right beside him, one of the divers. And the divers told him how we found these things, and, and he had a video that the government got hold of them and destroyed them. But uh, divers took one of these shells and went out and set it up on their uh, fence posts and started shooting at it with a rifle. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it. They got a little closer and the thing blew up. And they, said they were lucky that no one was killed. They were you know, full of, uh, it's like the shell you saw, the what goes in the musket. Yeah. And everything. And it's basically anything that was shattered. Well, they, they had those, uh, a case shot would be full of shrapnel, you know. Stuff like that. An exploding shell uh, would have been full of uh, like uh, musket bullets. Yeah. Yeah. And there might have been, uh, I believe we had one that we made, I think there's 75 to 80 of those inside of the, of the shells. And those little bullet things? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We, really went, up. we went to Antietam uh, this year. It's the 135th an anniversary of Antietam. Which the bloodiest day of the Civil War. There were, what, 33,110 casualties in you know, one day. Doug was our corporal. It was his first, first venture into being a corporal in, in the artillery. We've all drilled as, as infantry, but the artillery, we, we have a three inch ordnance right, which is a replica of the original cannon in every detail. And, uh, we went down there and drilled with a, fell in with the first pro dial. And we were the provost guard, which meant that we were in charge of protecting, standing guard of all the cannons that were there on the Union side. And there were 100 and, 110 cannons, I believe, total. There were 53 on the Union side. And, and Doug was a corporal, and I was private, so it was a lot of fun for me not to have the responsibility. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. What we represent in our group, too, is uh, <coughs> first month light artillery. And it's very said we have a three inch ordnance rifle. Three inch ordnance rifle, when we say three inch, what it means is the shell is three inches wide that goes into the, uh, the cannon. It's a uh, ordnance rifle because ours isn't, the original ones that first came out weren't rifle tubes. The barrels weren't right. Later on, after the Civil War had been going on for about, oh, probably a month or two, the contractors had to start rifling them, the same as the twist in your barrel. Yeah. So it gave the shell uh, more accuracy and more distance. Yeah, it was cool that we fired the thing actually, like a circular thing. Yeah, 
it's spin. Well. You know how a football goes in the air and like that? It's more accurate for the spin going to it. And what it was is that the sides of the shell would catch the grooves in the barrel and it starts spinning. And it would, that way when they hit you, it would start up here. It just would roll you down your whole body. Well, when they hit, they were, because the projectile weighed 10 pounds. Yeah. So yeah, when they hit, body left. they would just hit nothing. Yeah. But they, uh, the first Montlake artillery, that's what they were issued, was three inch ordnance rifles, so that's what they trained on. Uh, they had, they were also, their nickname was the Great Horse Brigade. Yeah. And the reason being, because all their horses were right. light colored or gray. They had showed uh, a lot of, uh, oh, grit and determination. Uh, they were, they were highly recognized for their skill, uh, especially being the three-inch ordnance rifle. The three-inch ordnance rifle will, this is taken from records, Confederate records. When the Confederates fell back around Atlanta and had the defensive works up around Atlanta, one Confederate gun was hit three times in a row by an unexploding Union shell. To hit that gun, the shell had to come through a 12 inch by 12 inch opening in the wall in the breastworks. The Union gun, which was a three inch ordnance rifle, was a half a mile away. A good gunner, a flour barrel had an end on it about this big. A good gunner could take out the end of a flour barrel nine out ten times at half a mile. Now these, that's how accurate these guns were. Then you end up with a battle like Pickett's Charge and they're standing shoulder to shoulder and they're marching three miles across an open field. Well, it was just a field at one mile. It was just a field day for these cannons. But that's why I said before, it was the dawning of modern Washington. They uh, won, I forgot what battle it was in, when the uh, First Vermont was ordered to spike their guns and leave them, get out of there, because the, the Confederates are advancing, there's no way of getting the guns out and everything. The gun had to be moved any long distance by each gun was pulled by six horses. You had to hook onto a limber, which carried the ammunition chest, and then six horses pulled it. No, what is spiking? Spiking was called, the proper way to spike a gun would be you taking something similar to a nail, heated it red hot, stuck it down, the vent of the gun is where you put your primer in. So you load a gun, you, after you go through the process of swapping and all that, you ram a, a charge down, a powder charge, which is a sack full of black powder, upwards to a pound of powder. Then, through the vent hole where your primer goes, you make a hole in that, you've got a pick about this long, you drop it down in, you break a hole in the sack. And you have a primer which, when broke, I mean, it is a tube, when it's broke, it drops a fire into that sack of powder, making it explode and uh, forcing your projectile out. And how it destroys the cannon. So well, no, what this was, that's how the cannon fired. To spike a gun, through that hole, you'd put that through, you'd put a red hot, like a nail, but it'd be a long one. So you pound it in there, so when it hit the bottom of the barrel, it curved, like this, up around. So as, after it cooled, and the rebels had gotten hold of that gun, they couldn't just yard that nail out. It took quite a process to get that nail out and spike it. But uh, these, uh, the first Vermont was ordered to spike their cannons and leave. And the commander in charge of uh, that battery so we'll spike in a double canister. Double canister is like a shotgun shell is to uh, you know to a shotgun. It's full of it has twenty-one lead brown balls this big. He put double of them in. So there's forty-two of those coming out. And they start spreading the minute they leave the muzzle of the gun. And just for they're close for infantry coming in, it's close. And they kept up such a rate of fire it forced the rebels back. As he said, I'll spike them with double canister. In other words, we aren't leaving our guns. We haven't lost them yet, and we never will. And this is uh, there again. Uh, the attitude like that uh, followed in other states and like that. But to know uh, the Vermonters, you know, they, this was their attitude. You know, we aren't losing our guns. We 
would stand right here and they actually turn the tide of the battle. Uh, would you say the Vermonters were pretty independent minded compared to Yeah. Yeah, you know, very, very. The, the thing was, as far as stealing and stuff <coughs> like that, uh, a friend of mine who has long since passed away, his wife's family had letters. And they were there. Her ancestors were in from New Jersey up, uh, regiment, and it was kind of comical because in a letter that was sent home to her, her ancestors, it said, "Well, it's cold here again tonight, and those SOBs from her mom have stole our wood again." <laughs> so yeah, a lot of that, that was in the big camps and like that. So yeah, Vermonters would go out and like that, and they were, you know, to. Uh, like, I'm a good sized person. But the, the first guys that went in, they were big farm boys. There is a shirt a guy had that I could swim in. And it was a shirt worn by a soldier in the Civil War. And like that. I, it's big on me. Yeah. And this is, uh, you know, the first guys that went in, they were big. They were big. And uh, they're good old farm boys. One of the stories that I like is uh, the. the Vermont Brigade was, was uh, stationed next to the New Jersey Brigade. And they have, have a little, like a smokehouse to keep their meat and stuff in. This was for a winter camp. Well, the New Jersey guys were sneaking in there stealing their meat. And so the Vermonters, they figured out they'd retaliate somehow. So the general or a colonel or someone from the from New Jersey guys had a big St. Bernard. So they snuck over there and they stole that dog. They brought him home, they killed him, they dressed him off. They hung his carcass in the smokehouse. True story. <laughs> and the New Jersey guys come sneaking in there at night and they took the dog back and they cooked it and they ate it. And every time the Vermonters would go by, the New Jersey guys would go, oh, oh, like <laughs> that. And they laid it right on. They were, they just had a little bit of an edge, you know. For, that. I mean, I'm sure it's true of the other, other groups. But I like to read about and hear about the Vermont guys. <laughs> they had a little bit of competitiveness. See, the thing being, it goes back to like I said. You went in as a group. Your neighbor down the road was with you in the war, <coughs> and if you were in the same part of the service and everything, uh, so you knew, you know. Artillery was more or less uh, part of them. I have a, a great great grandfather who was in the first Vermont Light Artillery. He was a gunner. And, uh, you know, he didn't have people that were from around here with him. Because it was, uh, you know, major, the majority of the men that went in, they would have gone into like infantry and like that. The artillery was kind of put together with a, with a, mac, with a mismatch. Not a mismatch. Uh, I don't know. Questions mainly. Uh, can't say much more on the artillery. Is well, just talk about the cornfields. Oh, the uh, yeah, and the, the Battle of Antietam was, was was fought in different stages, but one of them was the corn, the Battle of the Cornfield. Uh, fought at uh, 4 a.m. in the morning. And we went down and reenacted that battle. And uh, go ahead, Doug. They were, <laughs> you know, to do like, you know, a lot of people get the wrong impression of a reenactor. There are reenactors out there that it's like cowboys and Indians. Our purpose, our group, were thought of throughout the whole United States as a very, very uh, good group dedicated. For like the research on the shirt and like that, we we believe in living and surviving the way the soldier did, and not well. Okay, yeah, we're going to pretend we eat this for supper and run down to the tent down here and have ourselves a hammer. You know, we don't believe in that. We sleep on the ground. Uh, at the uh, we were awoke we were woke at three o'clock in the morning. The cornfield there where we had our gun. Was uh, that changed hands in the actual battle 15 times, and we had gone into this, and it was uh, 
we're always striving to see how close we can come to the actual the reality of what these guys went through. Well, 5.30 in the morning, when it was just start getting light, we'd already been in battle, we'd already been firing, and everything. And we, you could see the mist rise in the black powder smoke clearing a little bit, and off to your side, you saw the, there was 20 other guns with us, up around, like this, and you could hear the rebels screaming off in the rebels yell. The, the yell there, and like that, and everything, and this was as close to real as you want to experience. What kind of yell? The, the, the rep regular yell. They, they had a... Uh, Battle yell. They had a, a distinct yell that they would do. It was like war whooping or uh, dogs yelping. And it was an intimidation factor and also psyched them up. And I, I, I know darn well that General Lee or, or Longstreet or, or some of their generals uh, soon learned that the more you get these guys hyped up, the better they're going to fight. And in this darkness, when you, you, you couldn't see from here to that wall, and, it, and there's a cornfield there, and it's over people's heads, so you know they're right there somewhere, close. And they're screaming at the top of their lungs. You know, yippity, 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 yippity. And, and it's a roar, because it's 30,000 of them, you know. And in actuality, at uh, Antietam, there was probably, what, maybe 1,000. <coughs> maybe maybe 2,000. I don't know. A lot of them. And you, you're just, just, if you get back into it, you go back to history when you're in that position, and you're thinking, those they're not going to charge this gun. We have the loudest cannon. In, the, in all of the 53 guns that were down there, we have the meanest son of a gun of a cannon you ever saw. It, it just bellows. And I was in number two position, which is right up in front of the gun. And the 12 feet away, there's another one here. 12 feet away, there's another one there. And so on. They keep going. And <laughs> the officers get to stand back, you know. But that gun, Honest to God, it shakes the ground with blanks. So if you just imagine what that would be like with a live round, bigger charge, we only use nine ounce charges, and a projectile in front of it to make it even more, you know, more pressure when it comes out, comes out the barrel. It would be incredible. But anyway, those rebels are over there <coughs> screaming and yelling, and they're going to come and, and if they fire a volley, every one of these gunners. There were only there's eight in our group and our crew on a gun. So if there's a thousand muskets over there, your chances are pretty bad. <laughs> but they won't come. You see, they won't come up to this gun. You know they won't. Cause they're going to kill them. You know. I mean that. Wow. wow. And then go ahead to the rest of it. No, it was uh, it's very very unique experience. The intimidation. The uh, you know, the, what the soldier went through, uh, what we go through uh, when we're in an event, the everyday thing, like moving the gun or, you know, in your process of sleeping like this, you, you think, well, this is, this is memorable, you know, like that, but you got to understand, this is what these guys went through every day of their life, and everything, when they were in the service, they, uh, the food they experienced, uh, like I said, we had flour, raw bacon, a uh, handful of rice, handful of salt, and we were we were expected to live on that for three days. And uh, that uh, vegetables, I don't dried up vegetables. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and what did they do? And you had to fend for yourself. Well, if you got back late, it's getting dark and like that. We well, ate your rice half cooked. Like that. And this is something they did. And uh, learning what they, uh, you know, what they felt like when they got up in the morning. Uh, you know, thoughts going through their mind. Uh, even though it was it was just a reenactment, when you're standing there and you can't see, you hear that, and you know this. Well, the rebel army was uh, 7,000 strong at, at this reenactment. We had 20,000 reenactors at this thing. We had over 100,000 spectators. Went on for four days. Oh, wow. And then you have like 700 people yelping. Well, we would have upwards to, uh, in that one section, could be 3,000. And I don't care, you even say, uh, oh, it's just reenacting. You know, nothing, nothing, you aren't going to get hurt or anything, unless you stumble and fall or something like that. Well, when you have 3,000 of those muskets pointed at you, they all open up. You know, you go 
goes through your, you say, son of a gun. Now you imagine what it was like for the soldier that actually went through that and stood there and said, well, obviously no one was aiming at me but I was not standing. But all around him, they just dropped him like flies and everything. And, uh, that's, that is, uh, and this one here was as close to going onto a time machine and going back as you could possibly ask for. <coughs> Someone running through on a motorcycle, or someone drinking mm -hmm. coffee out of a styrofoam cup, or anything like that. It's, this is the way to go. Did you have horses there? Oh, yeah. One of the grandest things I've ever seen is a full, they only used four horses, where six were used before, but a four horse hitch with a limber and a cannon on behind it. This cannon alone weighs over 2,000 pounds. <laughs> this is a three inch ordnance rifle. This is one of the small cannons, it weighs 2,000 pounds. And you have the limber. The ammunition chest, which weighs, can weigh up to 300 pounds, sitting on top of that. Your, your horses, your, your team was controlled by a man. You had two, you had six horses. Opposite, you had the first two, there was one rider on one side. Behind him on that horse, there was another rider. He controlled his horse and that one. So you had three guys driving those horses. <coughs> and to see one of those nowadays go charging out across the field, you know, it was, it was unbelievable to see, you know, in today technology and everything like that, but to witness this was really, before it was a very common occurrence. You know, and have horses stand there when you let off three ounces of black, I mean, no. nine ounces of black powder, and have a, a lieutenant holding his horse by the end of the reins back here, and there's a cannon right there. First battle, I turned it because he's a stranger to us. I said, sir, we're ready, our gun's up, we're ready to fire. Don't go like this, how about your horse? I mean, there's uh, 20 guys, there's, all, there's over 200 men standing around here that don't want to get mauled by this horse like old bull. Well, no problem, he says. Stand right from here to that radio right there from yeah. the cannon. How much would it be, would it be uh, if this was the end of the muzzle, if the, the, I think it's the major, stand there with, with a horse, with a halter, not the rain. And that can was felt and jumped back. Horse just stood. I couldn't believe. It. No, something back then was very common. But nowadays, so where did all these horses come from? Like, did, does each company bring their own stuff yeah, to all yeah. this reenactment? Oh yeah, there's there's huge <coughs> reenactment groups, of, and they have their own horses. And certain, there was one pair of real flashy Vermont Mortars. I mean, real nice horses. And they, they went out into the, the last day there, they went out across our front and up a hill, you know, and they really ran. I mean, they're right on the cow. And they unlimber, which means they take the limber off, face the cannon to the, aim it towards the enemy, and fire it, limber it back up, and off they go again. And those horses were incredible. You, you would never dream you could keep your horse there. You know, I, um, well, Doug is modest though about this this thing down. He left out one important factor about the the cornfield down there. He was an officer with privates, you know. He corporal, corporal. Well, hey, hey, that's from close him. enough for me. <laughs> but our we were there firing into this cornfield, and there's infantry up on the right here, and there's the rebels up on the left, and they're firing across their front. This is exactly the way it happened. And <coughs> All of a sudden, we were felt we fell into the first Rhode Island. So there, sorry, gave the order, action rear, which means the rebels are behind you. <laughs> yeah. And so we have to, you have to move the limber chest because that's where all the ammunition is. And then out around the cannon, and then move the cannon. <laughs> well, we did that, and not much further from here to the community center was a line of about a thousand rebels. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> and they had us. I mean, we were flanked, and so what? We were taken prisoner and killed. But how, how do you guys enact like the deaths and stuff like when you guys are firing back and forth? You Nobody know. wants to do it. But yeah. If you're if you're asked to, because uh, the spectators are paying a lot of money to watch this, mm -hmm. and they want to see. For, and that's why they don't want to see you standing there with a styrofoam cup. They also, they want to see something reality. Hey, look, this guy just, just come, he just entered their 
Musk gets into this, you know, battery, why, uh, you know, didn't anyone fall? So they'll request you to, to go down. I mean, you just, there's hey, some guys. You guys over there, you want to see some dead people. You know, they'll tell you this ahead of time and like that. But, uh, and there's some of them out there that, I had a guy at Cedar Creek in front of me. I mean, he folded like a map. It took me by surprise because the Confederates line had just let off. I was in the infantry, and he was uh, just ahead of me, and he went down just like a sack of wet cement. And I just, I, in all honesty, I thought something had hit him. You know, I thought some fool had put something in their musket or something, you know, a little piece of wood or stone or something, and like that. And I bent over him, and you know that I'm all right. Okay, I'll leave you here. Took his ammunition, which you're supposed to do, strip him of his ammunition. <laughs> And went on our way, but I mean, it's it's some of these guys really, really can do uh, uh, like in the film and the uh, movie Battle of Gettysburg. And you take uh, Sam Elliott and uh, those other guys like that. They said that the quality of acting and the quality of the their props, like this stuff here, uh, was so so better, so much better than what Hollywood. Could they said we needed a tobacco pouch for uh, Long Street. They were going to have to go back and manufacture one at one of the trailers. One says, well, the rebel stood there and he says, hey, who's mine? Well, it's better than anything they come up with and it was not that. <coughs> well, it's, uh, do, you, do you see things along the lines, like, do you see a lot of rebels coming from the south and a lot of, um, a lot of unions coming from the north playing the part? Uh, no, you run into a lot of, for some reason, uh, the rebel is, is, I don't know, I've seen, like I said, Antietam this year, I met a Texan from Illinois, I met a, a, a soldier from out that was representing Alabama, he was from Wisconsin. You know, they don't play, we, we, we play the part of who we are, we're Vermonters, and everything, we, uh, but a lot of them, the Confederacy, for some reason, and it holds right true uh, as far as the selling power of something. If you, like any of you in here, were an artist, and you're going to create a Civil War painting, do yourself a favor. Make sure there's a rebel flag in it somewhere. If you don't, it won't sell. If it has a Confederate flag in it, it will sell. And those Confederates, though, the, the reenactors are very dedicated. They, are. they were they were marching barefoot, which is the way they were. They didn't have to. You imagine going out on fifty yeah, acre cornfield? They, they were marching and, and uh, barefooted. This is a three day event and hot as can be. <coughs> and they marched through that camp. There was, in the actual battle of that of the cornfield, there wasn't a stock of corn on stand. And they were dead everywhere. Uh, both north and south. In their in this battlefield, it was the same thing. It was a rough ground, real rough, hard, rocky ground. Nothing like our good Vermont soil. <laughs> um, there wasn't any corn standing at all down. Half of it was knocked down by those rebel bare feet. Um, One other thing I'd like just to uh, well, leave you with is the feeling of a Vermont soldier had. And it's the only thing I've gotten out of basically the research I've done so far on my great great grandfather was a letter he sent home to his mother. And in the letter he stayed there the first one in taking my boats around came into Louisiana. And they were along with the eighth Vermont. And he said that they were waiting for their horses so they could pull their guns to be unloaded and stuff like that. But and uh, that they felt he was going into battle within a few days. And his attitude was, he didn't know if he was going to make it. You know, I may be dead two days from now. And, but we're going to show, and write the letter, we're going to show those rebels exactly how it's done. The enthusiasm was there. Even though the one may die tomorrow, the enthusiasm popped. And he's seen, here he is, he's from, uh, they're originally from East Montclair. And, you know, that's the only thing he'd ever seen. Now he's, in, he's seen half the, he's seen the whole eastern seaboard at this point. Uh, you know, and he's felt like he's traveled quite a bit. And he enjoyed seeing the different people and stuff like that. But one thing at the end he did say, he said, if I do live, I get back to Vermont, I'll never live again. Do you, do you find
find any hostility when you go do these reenactments? Like people really get so caught up in the role that they really take it ser sometimes, so seriously. Sometimes. There's that some. That's why I call the cowboy Indian. Now, I'm not going to say they're Confederates. I'm not going to say the Union. They're both. We got some Union reenactors that they shouldn't be reenacting because it's a, it's a game to them, and they bring the rest of the quality down. It's like you putting on a course and having real professionalism and pride in what you got, and then someone coming in working with you and destroying it to just you know be a non-professional and everything. And uh, it's all what you want out of it. And our thing is, and it's nothing we demand in our group. But our thing is, is, is to be as close as possible to what you know these guys went through. And after going through it, it is, <coughs> these guys were these guys were nothing but when they came through something like that, they had to be. You talk about lean and mean. These guys had to, to work like that. And I grew, you know, I'd be in trouble with these glasses. In fact, I marched in the parade in Dallas and I was busy and stacked and all that. And hold them straight in the line. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it, it, it's a thing that you have to grow in. Uh, when I first started, I was basically interested in getting a uniform. I brought a set coat like that. And, uh, the, Guys, you know, kept saying, hey, "You got to get this. You got to get that." More money. It costs about, well, about fifteen hundred dollars to get a uniform. Probably more now. I don't know. And do you have somebody that hand sews those? You know, I mean, are they're all hand sewn, right? These uniforms we bought. Okay. They're they're, ma they're made at uh, somewhere in the south. Mississippi. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> what they were, I wanted to say about uh, you know the bravery of these soldiers. I think it was that it's fought into a, it, it, There's so many battles; it's hard for me to keep them all straight. They knew they were going to catch them, so they took pieces of paper and they they put their name on them and they sewed them or pinned them to the back of their coat because they figured they didn't want to be anonymous. You know, they didn't want to be the unknown soldier. <coughs> they wanted somebody to know them, to write home and, and tell their folks that they died facing the end. That was a big thing. They, they didn't want to get shot in the back. They, that was the worst thing that could happen to them. And uh, put their name on their coat and ruined the battle. They knew they were coming back. Were there a lot of prisons, too? I mean... No, I was having so much a lot of prisons, but there were uh, Libby and Andersonville great, you know, death holes and everything. Uh, it's, uh, they just did a movie on Andersonville, but in reality, exactly, it was a place where the Union soldiers was kept. And to, it'd be good to, if you're studying the Civil War, you know, to watch that, one thing it does bring home, you, know, you pick out some things that are real, real, right down the line as far as being authentic, is the fact you're drinking water. And a brook running through the middle of the prison camp. Well, way up above was a Confederate camp. Then their sinks, where they, you know, did all their stuff. Then it went down through where they kept all their livestock. Then it went through uh, Andersonville Prison, where all the prisoners were. So your water that you were drinking there had gone through one camp already. It went through their latrines, basically. Went through their livestock pens and then ended up to you to drink and wash it. <coughs> and this is very, this they, they were thrown in there and nothing to eat, nothing to eat. Fed for yourself. And like that, you're talking thousands upon thousands of men. It was a death ball. Same thing as the And both of them had it. The South didn't have any food to spare for prisoners. Do they have huge, like, burial grounds? Mass burial pens. You don't know who was there. Yeah. Uh, my cousin who was in the group, he had an uh, ancestor from East Montclair that was in there, uh, Henry Wakefield, that who, who he was, who portrays when he's in doing this. And he died in a prisoner of war camp. He's buried somewhere in the south. That's the closest thing he had. See, the first, the first prisoners of war were pro. And uh, the boat run in uh, 1862, they uh, captured a bunch of of uh, soldiers, and they'd make them sign a, uh, a waiver that they wouldn't go back in battle until an 
equal number of rebel soldiers were let back. So they, they, so they were paroled. Well, that went good until the USSS Grant came along and he said, hey, wait a minute, why should we let those rebels back? We're trying to kill them. So they stopped training prisoners. And that meant that the Union soldiers get caught at the same time. In the, in the North, because the North had the industrialization, they were able to feed their prisoners a little better. There were prisons in Chicago and up in uh, New York, uh, Port Hudson, New York, and uh, they were in the same. They were starved and, and they didn't have any medical treatment. It was terrible. <coughs> they did have enough food, so they gave them a little better ration. You know, in, in Andersonville and down there, they they were killing rats. They, they, the big sport was a rat would come through and the whole camp would go after it and catch it. And that probably doesn't get reenacted, does it? I think they did. <laughs> I think they, they were. Um, they caught rainwater for drinking. They, uh, there was a whole society in the in the in the prison itself of the prisoners. You know, they had uh, police and they had uh, outlaws that would steal you, beat you, kill you. And the whole gang of society was right in there. Basically, the, the Confederates, all they were cared about was stay inside the stockade. What happened inside the stockade was up to them. They were. But, you know, they, and also your, you know, your leaders, let's say the commanders of the prison and your top officials like that. They weren't <coughs> West Point quality men. They were the scourge of the command. They couldn't do anything else but take care of them. So, and of course, they were they were upset half the time because they were on the battlefields getting the war. So they're ugly all the time. So if they had an excuse to kill half a dozen guys, they would. So, it's not, you know, there's some some value to that. Do you think there's any cannibalism in the Civil War? Prisons? Around uh, in Vicksburg and yeah. Fort uh, Hudson and like that, yes, there was. Uh, went down through. I mean, uh, the, the worst of your nightmare was being like at Vicksburg and, uh, you know, everyone's starving, but there's, there's some people that aren't starving. You know, they don't, they don't look bad. They're, they're still all flushed out and everything. And, well, there's only one place they can get flushed. That was after mules and everything else, and the rats. I think they. I don't think they really found it. Vicksburg, Vicksburg, actually, uh, when the Union finally did get in there, I think they were surprised to see there wasn't any rats in there. It all moved. So this was by the rebels. By the rebels? Uh, no, it wasn't by the army. It was by the citizens of the, of the city. See, Vicksburg was right on the bend of the Mississippi River. <coughs> they had the big gun barricades on the rebels on top of it. And they controlled the Mississippi, lower the Mississippi of, of uh, Chippewa. And the Union wanted to strangle the Confederacy. So they had the, the blockade all around the, you know, Florida and the whole area was blockaded. So that the, the rebels couldn't get much supply. They did some, not a lot. But the Mississippi was open. And, uh, and Grant, who was then in, in the, in the uh, Tennessee campaign, was the, took it over. He tried several ways to, to get at Vicksburg. They tried to bombarding it, didn't work. So they surrounded it and, uh, and started the mouth, basically. And that's where he got his name, Unconditional Surrender. Uh, because, uh, oh golly. Was it Fremont? The uh, general was in the, in Vicksburg. And was trapped. Wanted to negotiate the surrender, you know, and uh, granted <coughs> unconditional surrender. And some of them escaped, but uh, for the most part, they got them all. Did did the um, soldiers get any kind of benefits when they got out of 
There was Judy. a pension, pension program. It wasn't much. Uh, you know, and there was a, they had a program to if you were a surviving member, a family member. Yeah. Exactly how much money I couldn't tell you that was. It wasn't a lot. Wasn't the money not even like, it wasn't even worth anything anyways. It was all like character basically. Up north here was that down south. Southern money wasn't it. No, dude, you just wanted it off to make it look good. I mean, I have some down south. I have some coins here. Yeah, it's because they were starting, they were trying to start their own union, which was basically the real point behind it, because they just wanted to succeed from the American government. They didn't really care for what was going on. That and the slavery issue. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, also, the uh, that's where tokens were coming out for the north. And tokens, same idea. You go down to New York City, subway token. Mm -hmm. This is where it, actually this started, uh, because what they would do is. Uh, It'd be like a, the token, if you were paid in a token, you could redeem it for what the token said, mm -hmm. or else eventually, maybe after the war, it was uh, worth quite a bit of money. You know, I mean, it was worth what, it, like it was a dollar token, after the war, you were supposed to be able to take that in, cash it in, and get a dollar for it. Yeah. <coughs> One train passenger rail system that gave out a lot of tokens. And it all but bankrupt them as soon as the day that they're paying their bills this way. You know, say so I owe you twenty dollars. <coughs> the rail company would give you twenty dollars worth of tokens. Well, finally, it, it ended up uh, at one point that soon after the war, the rail system went almost two years with free rides to people, and it put them under, I believe. Um, I was going to ask. It was a war that was unavoidable, uh, unavoidable. Because the one thing I don't know, uh, maybe more people realize it than I think, but the issue of slavery right. had been discussed when they were signing, when they were stating the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson says we gotta address this issue of slavery. They said let's put it basically let's put it on the back burner. Let's not bring it up now. It's gonna cause trouble. Let's get united so we can separate from England. So it was going to come, eventually it was going to come to it. Uh, what came out of it? Well, uh, uh, beyond the social issues of slavery and all that, was just the turning point of all the industrialization. You know, for instance, the Muslims. And then they developed the Gatlin Gun. Um, repeating revolvers, you know, the cult industry. Um, soon after, well, yeah, not so awful long after that gasoline engines arrived. And, uh, um, the submarine warfare, actually, you know, the first submarines were made during the Civil War. And, and the question is that the other question would probably be the whole thing about um, the difference about how wars become so impersonal and even kill large sums of people that doesn't affect you. Or but before you were right there on the front line seeing that for yourself and were interacting with it. And how do you guys feel about that too? Well, unfortunately, yeah, now they can uh I mean you do in the country by the push of a button. And uh it's hopefully I don't know. I, I don't know as far as I don't think it's not. Nowadays if you had if you had to take society today, no matter where they're from, and do what these guys had to do. There wouldn't be any war because they wouldn't do it. They would not go out and live like that. They would not go out and experience the bloodshed that these guys did. And everything had been, they'd do something else besides have a war. I see a civil war for me. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, like a war, but he means like for the government, people would live like this for the government. They would no, they wouldn't, they wouldn't, the volunteers. But, the well, <coughs> uh, if you look at it at the southern side, you can understand it a little, a little better. It was a real way of life. It's all they knew, and the slave. They had no conscience as far as the, the slave went, or that I suppose a few did. But you know, that was a way of life, and it's a way of life. And um, so they. And it was affecting the. They couldn't do their. They couldn't run their plantations without them. They thought. So they would fight. You can understand why they fought. Also, they 
They could. The yeah. Um, national. Yeah. National. I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah, <laughs> but, I, I know. It's a, that's the thing yeah. that I think about. Like, the whole concept um, of a, a different culture, but then at the same time, the racism. And then also after the Civil War, how um, all the laws were put in, all the racist laws were put in place, and how a large percentage of African Americans ended up going back work on the farms because they needed jobs. Yeah. And but the only difference was they would get paid instead of working for nothing. But that pay was yeah, it was sharecroppers. It was not very no. much at all. So no, it, I don't think it, as far as yes, the slave was free, but as far as his rights, I don't know. So he had to have any more rights. And because of intimidation, the pain, you know, good luck to find Whatever. Uh. Well, in essence, he did have more rights. I mean, he was getting paid. It's a lot better than being whipped. It's well, some of his slaves still, he were in pretty good shape, though, as slaves. Uh. I mean, not all of them were being whipped. Uh, they were very dedicated slaves, uh, you know, and I don't think, I think they were part of the family. Yeah, well, just no, no matter, matter where you go and throw a time, there's always different people. Yeah. Not everyone's going to be the type of person that's going to whip this slave. Right. I mean, some people do respect their help. So if you knew how to count those numbers to, that, to evaluate that, I don't know. But um, the, the northern soldiers, not only Vermont soldiers, but the northern soldiers, really felt deeply that they should be free and able to do their own thing. They, they died for it. I mean, the, there was a lot of... And my wife's ancestors, the, the Fosters, became officers in the, in the colored brigades. I have a book here about that, too. I'll leave with you if you want it. Um, Army Life in the Black Regiment. And uh, it took a while for them to, to earn their, the, the black soldiers to earn their merits. Uh, because of the contraband coming into the camp, the, the soldier, general, lowly soldier, would look at them and, you know, he didn't know what to think because they were so poor and they were downtrodden and they talked different and uh, they didn't know whether they were going to be good soldiers or not. They didn't. And of course, Lincoln wanted, wanted them to be soldiers, but there was a lot of problems with officers uh, letting, letting them be soldiers. You know. Finally, when they did, then they were always given the dirtiest job that was there, you know? Yeah, because they also had to play nice and they might have to go through that was a lot more set up. Yeah, I guess that's right. And it was, I think it was more too in the upper echelons of society where these these uh, prejudices were. I don't think that the dirt soldier, the private soldier, felt that. But in Petersburg, um, when the Petersburg was in, in uh, Siege, you know, in trench warfare, and uh, the Pennsylvania guys dug the trench underneath the rebel lines and blew it up. I'm sure you've read about that or heard about it. They, if if uh, General Letty, I believe his name was, had let the black troops, which were which Grant wanted to go first, if he'd let them go through, the war would have been over nine months before it did in 1865. But he didn't, because he was prejudiced. Uh, so he was afraid, number one, that if they took a terrific slaughter, that there'd be repercussions, you know, because they, all these black soldiers were put out there to be killed. And number two, if they actually succeeded, they'd be looked on as better soldiers than the white guy. So he didn't. He was a drunk anyway. He's no good lady, you know. And he was actually drunk the day of that battle. <laughs> and, and, well, yeah. And... So it all went to naught. They blew up the trench, the big, huge crater that was on 500 pounds of black powder or something like that in this trench. And they blew a great crater in the hole, and there was a hole and a path right straight to Richmond, which was, what, 12, 13 miles away. <laughs> and the uh, Union troops poured into that crater, and they didn't go any further. And they, they were down in that crater which was huge, and that's where it all ended. 
Meanwhile, Lee marshaled his forces and 